Welcome everyone to the BAUS Endourology update, uh, the Tuesday afternoon of our first virtual BAUS. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, the members of the committee who will be talking in this section and, and giving you our traditional endourological update for the year. Uh, we're going to start with uh, now Professor Ben Turney, who's going to talk about the stent registry update uh, and in particular, some of the things that you may be able to do now that the uh, centrally held BAUS registry um, has gone offline. Uh, so first up will be Ben, uh, followed then by Rob Calvert, who is the secretary of the section, as you know, who's done an enormous amount of work over the past couple of years about the codes uh, for the procedures that we do. And in particular, trying to distinguish ureteral rhinoscopy from PCNL. Um, it's been a labour of love for Rob getting that done. Um, and in addition to talking about those, uh, having been on the NICE guideline committee that published at the beginning of 2019, and then the NICE quality standards um, uh, in the spring of this year, he will update us about the NICE quality standards uh, as well. Uh, next up will be Will Finch, uh, who took over as uh, from um, Ollie Wiseman as the uh, lead for the PCNL audit um, and in addition to doing that work and giving us some of the uh, the final throws of the PCNL registry uh, has spent a huge amount of time also with uh, with Rob Calvert on developing a renal colic snapshot audit and will give us the first introduction there'll be a few mentions of uh, that of that particular piece of work during the conference and then out of the PCNL registry uh, comes uh, the uh, NSIP and benchmarking for PCNL, uh, and we'll get a flavour of that from Will too. Uh, next and fresh from the success of a virtual FRCS Girol revision course, uh, Harry Rattan, who's the BAUS uh, national lead for SPR uh, teaching and training, uh, will tell us about uh, training over the last six months and um, some of the visions for the future. Uh, and then I will talk about the WCE fund update, uh, some opportunities maybe for travel when uh, travel again comes online. And then most of all, some of our uh, hopes, plans and aspirations uh, for a brighter year ahead. Thank you for joining this session. I'm just going to give you an update about the BAUS stent registry, which many of you have been contributing to over the past few years. Um, this is the BAUS stent registry uh, link on the website, and this is now closed for um, any contributions in March of this year. And the purpose of the next few minutes is just to give you an update of the data that was collected uh, over the duration of the registry. So the register has been uh, collecting data for 10 years, starting in 2010. As you can see from this graph, uh, it shows the number of uh, stent insertions recorded in the registry over that 10 year period in the gray bars. Uh, and as you can see, by sort of 2014, uh, it peaked at uh, around 3000 stents recorded each year. Uh, the blue line shows the number of sites that were using the registry uh, and it got up as high as 60 uh, at its peak in 2014 but has been declining uh, in recent years. So over this 10 years uh, 105 sites actually contributed uh, data and there were 20,283 stent insertions recorded over that 10 year period. However, uh, this is slightly misleading because uh, many of these sites actually only recorded well, less than 10 uh, stent insertions. In fact, nearly half of the sites recorded uh, less than 10 insertions uh, and many sites uh, less than 100. Uh, so there were relatively few sites that recorded high volumes of stent uh, insertions. Uh, there were six sites, however, that did manage to record over a thousand stents uh, in the 10 year period. Uh, how valuable has the stent registry been? Well, this shows the number of rec uh, removals recorded. So obviously all those previous graphs were just the insertions, but the purpose of a stent registry is to also record the removal. And that's important so we don't get these encrusted stents, which we all face 
and clinical practice. Uh, here you can see that the centers that uh, inserted more stents uh, were better at recording the removal. So you can see the high volume uh, sites uh, inserting more than 500 uh, stents in the 10 year period had a nearly 80% removal uh, record, but the low volume sites were uh, around 50-50 as to whether it was recorded, whether it had been removed or not. And that really is the concern with these stent registries is even in the best sites, 20% or so of these stents are not recorded uh, having been removed. And that really raises the value of a stent registry. And this has been a recurring theme with stent registries all around the world. Um, stent removal was recorded for only 80% of the stents that were inserted. And as I say, even in the best uh, centers with high volumes, uh, one in five stents was not tracked as ever being removed. So the question is, does, this, does the registry give a false sense of security? Or is having four out of five recorded better than not even trying at all? Uh, other commercial apps have been available to try and track stents, but these also uh, have been withdrawn. So the challenges with stent registries are that they're insert, stents are inserted at different sites uh, for different services, urology, transplant, oncology, radiology, gynecology, and colorectal surgery all may put stents in. And these stents are removed at different places and different locations and by different members of different teams. Uh, and so the challenge there is to keep track of when these stents go in and when they come out and everyone's got to be aware of the registry and contribute, otherwise the value is reduced. There is however a potential uh, option for the future and certainly we're now investigating this option which is to prescribe stents through the EPR registry. And the advantage of an EPR is that this should link all of these services together. And if we prescribe the stents through EPR, then we could then track uh, the stents wherever they are and wherever they're inserted. So that for a stent to be inserted, it needs to have a unique sort of tracking reference uh, as if we were prescribing a drug and then a reminder pops up uh, like stopping an antibiotic. And this may be a solution in the future. Um, but for now, the stent registry with BIOS is closed and um, we have to think locally about the best ways of tracking our stents. Thank you for your time. Um, welcome. Um, congratulations for uh, logging on to the BICE conference talk with the most boring title, Changing Codes and Nice Quality Standards. Um, I hope that I can show you that these are quite important fundamentals in improving patient care and the success of the BICE audit system. So what is the section trying to achieve in audit? Well, we're looking at creating real-time feedback um, of practice at a consultant at unit level. Um, that's the NSIP project and Will Finch will be talking about that a little bit in the next talk. Um, and we're also looking at um, getting focused snapshot audits to help individual units identify areas to focus on to improve patient care. Ultimately, we need better data and we also need more useful data. And the section has been working quite hard to try and work out what best patient-focused outcomes um, are the most important. And this will be a main part of our audit. We also need evidence-based standards. Uh, many of you will know that the professional coders in the hospital measure many of the things and record many of the things that we do. Um, and the procedures are recorded using the OPCS coding system. The OPCS codes are often quite historic and often set by, and they're set by a national committee. Um, the underlying methodology is quite confusing and rigid and often doesn't quite make sense to clinicians. Um, with stone codes, um, there are a lot, there's a lot of duplication historically, and there has been some great reluctance to change or retire old codes. And the codes certainly have not kept up with modern practice. Um, in stone disease, this has changed quite dramatically over the last few decades. The committee has been working quite hard um, over the last several years um, to engage with the code coders to change and rationalize this. Um, one example of the uh, historic coding problems was that there were never was actually a code set for frozen laser or retrograde intrarenal surgery. The code that many hospitals use um, M093, M09, is actually a PCNL code. There's also M16.4. This has led to great confusion and miscoding. And as we know, our incomes are also based on these codes through PBR. So 
your unit may be losing light if you don't get the coding right. This has also caused great difficulty comparing like with like with HES based analysis um, or orders of stone procedures. Um, so these are the new codes. I'm not going to go through all the old historic codes because that will be highly confusing. But M27 is the code for ureteroscopy for ureteric stone. These are the OPCS three digit codes. The new code that we've introduced is M07, and that is for ureteroscopy for kidney stone. And M09 is the PCNL code. M26 is the much less used code for P, um, percutaneous urethrolithotomy. Um, we have retired M28, which was a duplicate code more or less for, M, for M27. And we've also got rid of M16.4. So this is a basis to go forward with to help consistency in comparing like with like in coding. These are some of the four digit subcodes, and I'm not going to go into these in detail, but I will uh, flash them onto the screen so interested parties may um, pause this recording later and look at them. Suffice to say that the most commonly used codes tend to be the first one, so um, ureteroscopic laser stone fragmentations, M27 one for a ureteric stone. For a kidney stone, M071 is probably the one that's going to be most commonly used. And um, PCNL with um, ultrasound as the fragmentation device will be M091. Moving on to quality standards, um, earlier this year, there's also been um, a, a publication of five quality standard statements for kidney stone treatment. Um, and this is again has been developed by a national committee that both uh, Dickie and I have been involved in. And um, it's aimed not just at urologists and healthcare professionals, but also at service providers and commissioners. And the aim is to identify gaps and areas for improvement. So we can look at changing how services are organized, reallocating resources as needed, and perhaps changes in clinical practice. Um, they are evidence-based, and we've tried to make them very patient relevant. They are strongly influenced by NICE guidelines, but also by a number of other sources of evidence. And I'll put them up on the screen here. The first one is getting the right analgesia. So non-steroidals as first line pain management for renal colic, unless contraindicated. And the second standard is getting a CTKUB within 24 hours of presentation for renal colic. Now we acknowledge that many units try and do it much faster than this. And indeed the section would advocate trying to get the CT scan done in the A&E department. But this standard is also meant for patients presenting in primary care so um, your health care um, services will need to look at trying to facilitate GP access to CT scans within 24 hours. The third standard is looking at getting treatment, either lithotripsy or ureteroscopy of ureteric stones in less than 48 hours once the decision to treat has been made. Um, so if the pain is not tolerated and ongoing or if the stone is unlikely to pass. This will be a difficult and challenging standard uh, for many units to meet but certainly this is something that will benefit patients. And the last two standards um, are fairly straightforward, checking serum calcium in patients presenting with kidney stones and also offering a generic um, stone prevention diet and fluid advice to those presenting with stones. This is what the advice is, and I will also include some links at the end so you can look at this in a little bit more detail afterwards. Um, so the national audit aims to produce focused drivers to improve patient care. And Will will be talking about this next. Um, we have got the audit, the renal colic audit on the NHS England quality accounts, which means that trust participation is mandatory. And some of the uh, monitoring bodies um, may well uh, look for evidence that trusts um, and service providers are trying to aim to meet these standards or making efforts to improve services in that direction. Ultimately, this is aimed to help urologists help patients. And here we are for some more information. Thank you. Uh, well, good evening, everybody. Um, so my name is Will Finch. I'm um, the audit lead for the endo urology section. And in the next five minutes, I'm going to give you an update uh, on the endo urology audits, namely the PCL registry interaction with the NSIP project. And the new launched at this virtual BAUS 2020, the renal audit, colic audit um, for 2021. So the PCNL registry has been a 
significant piece of work for Baos and been a fantastic journey from 2011 through to 2019. Uh, it closed at the end of December. There was over 13,000 cases amassed within the registry from nearly 250 consultants and nearly 150 NHS centres contributed. There's been a significant number of publications, presentations and posters, and it's a huge thank you to all of those who've been involved, set it up, but a massive thank you to Sarah Fowler and the Baus team for supporting it and running it. So where are we now with it? Well, individuals um, can still export their data out of the Baus Dendrite platform. I looked at that today. Uh, the registry data, we are planning to use it for a PCNL risk assessment tool to allow people to put in certain preoperative factors and calculate using the registry data the risk of perhaps infections or a complication after surgery. Uh, people have been concerned about how they capture this individualised data going forward, and that will be an individual's responsibility. But we are looking to work with NSIP, and the project is evolving uh, to be able to provide surgeons with procedural data and linking that with HESS and outcome data to give people more enhanced individualised data uh, for those procedures. So the next project um, is the Renal Colic Snapshot Audit, which will be uh, next year's BAUS National Audit. Um, this is an audit which is not looking at procedures, it's looking at pathways. And one of the criticisms of the registry previously was this was only really applicable to a, a relatively small number of urologists. Renal colic and this audit will be relevant for all urology units. Um, it's a quality improvement project and it has a number of questions and it allows measurement of practice against nice standards and will identify areas within the renal colic pathway uh, that need change or warrant change. The output of the audit will be objective, benchmarked, unit level data which will allow clinicians in units to facilitate change and provide objective data to give them work with management to help affect those changes so it's something we're very excited about. The data collection will be retrospective and it will be entered in in March 2021 on patients who have presented in November 2020. The inclusion criteria is patients presenting acutely with renal colic and found to have a stone or stones in a unilateral ureter or renal pelvis. We're excluding bilateral ureteric stones from this audit and the data will be entered at unit level. Uh, it will be anonymized. We're using JOT form as with the, the, the bladder outflow obstruction audit last year, this year, sorry. And it can be put in on a tablet or a smartphone or a computer. There's logic within the questions, so you won't see all of the questions depending on scenarios. And it's 41 questions maximally and about 10 minutes of work. And it assesses management, the assessment, the outcome and long-term prevention of renal colic. We're conscious of COVID, we're conscious of a second wave and the variation of that wave, second wave across the country. And we're very conscious it's another thing for people to have to do within their precious time. There's been much discussion this week um, within the endo section, but also between the section and the audit steering group. And we feel that it's very important that this audit does go ahead with the timeline I've described to give us baseline data. And this baseline data will allow us to demonstrate improvement, but the improvements are, are needed with the renal colic pathway nationally and it's important to allow people to identify areas that need change and to drive that change and implement positive change for our patients. Um, more information about the audit will be disseminated in the next week or so to audit leads at trusts. Um, there's a BAUS web page which has become live in the last 24 hours. And so in conclusion um, from a endo section audit, the PCNR registry is closed. Uh, to provide people going forward with uh, procedural data and outcome data, we're working with NSIP and that project is evolving and you'll hear more about that in the future. But the exciting news is the new snapshot renal colic audit uh, launched here at Virtual Bouts 2020, a quality improvement focus relevant to everybody. And we look forward to working with you with regards to that. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me to talk about um, endourology education. And those of you who don't know me, I'll just quickly introduce myself. I'm Harry Ratter, and I'm a consultant endourologist from Nottingham. 
Um, I'm on the section of endourology committee and I'm also currently the BAUS lead for uh, SPR training. So endourology education then we started really strongly at the beginning of the year. We of course had the, the absolutely excellent BSOC conference and we also had our third RSM study day, endourology study day and here's a tweet from our current uh, vice president of the section, Sri, uh, and a reply by our president, Darren, and it really was an excellent day. We had some great international speakers attend in person and some, some really great discussion uh, throughout the day. And, and we thought that we were heading for another year of fantastic meetings, conferences, skills courses, simulation, residential operative course which is due to be hosted this year by Bhaskar Samani in, South, in Southampton and of course our BAUS uh, modern management of stone disease course so we've got all that planned we were really excited about it and then of course along comes Covid and puts a stop to all of that so I'm in the slightly tricky position of not having that much to tell you about what we've done this year in terms of education however I think it's fair to say that there have been some positives because just like the Terminator, we came back with a slightly machine enhanced um, offering. So in terms of endourology, there were a few endourology um, webinars as part of the BAUS summer webinar series. Um, and then we had an endourology webinar to kick off the autumn series. We had Ollie Wiseman from Cambridge and my colleague Sharon Scrim talking about metabolic stone disease and I believe that was very well received and was a very interactive session and we've got many more of these short webinars planned. We have of course uh, been involved with uh, contributing to online conferences and meetings and it's great to see such a strong endourology program this year at, at BAUS, virtual BAUS. Um, there's been the formation of, of exam revision groups and in fact BAUS managed to run the FRCS urology course for 66 delegates over the course of a week entirely online. Um, I like to think it was a success, clearly there were things that, that, we, could, that we could learn from and, and continue to improve, but for first go the technology worked brilliantly thanks in no small part to the immense efforts of, of Harry Heald and Louise Finch in, in the BAUS office, who really are the, the technology whiz kids now. Um, and of course, there's, there's been the continued development of online knowledge courses and resources, including podcasts, both produced by BAUS and BJUI Knowledge, as well as commercial ones. And all these things have gone some way towards stemming the lack of uh, traditional on uh, uh, traditional face-to-face -face offerings. I think the biggest challenge for us as endurology is that we do rely very heavily on skill simulation as part of our training for, for both technical and non-technical aspects. And I think there's no substitute to the hand-on, I, th I don't think there's any substitute to the hands-on training um, using endourology models. And these have been hugely popular and successful and BAUS have run courses as well as industry partners that have sponsored it for both uh, PCNL as well as ureteroscopy and I think we do struggle to, to simulate those online however there have been some innovative ways of, of replicating the non-technical skills intraoperative decision making and Darren in fact Darren and I had a conversation about this and Darren encourages his trainees to engage in thought experiments about how to do an operation in your head if you like so what would you do if you come across a stone and you can't get a wire past it? What would you use? How would you change your approach? How might you disimpact stone? And all these things can just allow the trainee to think about doing the operation in their head. So hopefully it becomes easier when, when they're doing it on the, on the patient. I think there's a big role for recording procedures. I know my robotic colleagues in Nottingham record all their procedures and look back at them and critique them get peer feedback. And I think there's a big role for this in endourology training where we can record most of our operations. So going forward, what, what have we got planned? Um, well, we sadly decided not to run the modern management of stone disease course as part of BAUS. Uh, we just thought we couldn't do justice to it in a non-interactive format, but we're hoping to run it in the near future, including with our international guest speakers and there'll be further details about that coming up shortly 
We mentioned more webinars and going into 2021, clearly the future is uncertain. It would be nice to think that this time next year we'll all be meeting in person um, and being able to host hands-on training and such like, but I don't think we can assume that that's the case. And I think it's important to have all these contingent, contingency measures uh, in place just in case we, we are still under restrictions. So I think that's all I've got to say. So I'll hand you back to Darren and of course, happy to take questions um, at the end. Thank you very much. So back to me and the update of the World Congress of Endourology Fund, and then the, uh, the hopes, plans and aspirations for the year ahead. Uh, if you went to the conference uh, that was held at the Excel in uh, the autumn of 2015, um, not only was it a great endo urological event, uh, but under the uh, stewardship of Ollie Wiseman as our treasurer, uh, we were actually able to uh, keep the profit that was generated through the canny organisation of the BAUS team. Uh, so a fair sum of money was, uh, was, was achieved, and with it we've been able to award 10 travelling fellowships uh, since, since the first one in 2016. Uh, and because of the wise investments, even though £50,000 were spent on various travelling grants in 2019, there's still an adequate amount of, uh, of funds in, in that account to, um, uh, to use for you and do some good. So if you're interested in one of these, then you can find details about it on the website in the section of Endourology. If you click on the bottom right hand corner, as it's shown there, prizes and awards, that takes you to the relevant page. Uh, with a little click that's an application form. Uh, clearly at the moment it's, it's difficult for anybody to contemplate traveling uh, abroad or receiving guests themselves, but when things are brighter then that may be something for, uh, for people to look forward to. And similarly on the site there are some of the reports to uh, give some ideas and inspiration of some of the places and the things that you could perhaps go and see and do and learn uh, with the idea to bring those back to, um, to UK practice. So as far as the year ahead, of course, uh, we should have been in Nottingham uh, giving, this, uh, giving this address in person uh, and looking forward to um, what we'd achieved this last year and, and what was coming. Uh, so I've divided this section into four themes. Education, uh, we're very lucky as already mentioned to have Harry Ratton as the uh, SPR lead, but education runs throughout the whole of what uh, uh, BAUS does and BAUS Endourology does. Clinical practice, some visions for the future uh, and then inclusion um, a plea to uh, get involved so as far as the education is concerned um, webinars has been the thing of 2020 there'll be more of those uh, ollie wiseman is putting together a, a program including some commercial ones which gives us some good opportunities with all, all of our excellent friends from industry to set up some uh, some really top class educational content uh, and in particular, the course Modern Management of Stone Disease, I'm delighted to say that both um, uh, Brian Eisner and Peggy Pearl have agreed to do, um, do what they would have done if we'd been live for Modern Management of Stone Disease. And after a little bit of uh, dust settling after the conference, we'll put together uh, a couple of hours worth of state of the art stone teaching in late November, which will then be available to everybody to tap into and, uh, and learn a lot from. And then, of course, as education goes, the thing that we look forward to most of all, uh, we'll be going to Nottingham, where we where we should have been under the, um, the hosting of Harry Ratton and his colleagues in the autumn of 2021. And I'm sure we all hope and look forward to the opportunity of actually catching up in real life uh, with friends and colleagues and enjoying a chat about uh, where, where we've come from, uh, how we survived it all, and, uh, and then looking forward to a, a new normal. Uh, which brings us nicely on to uh, clinical practice and preserving the positive from COVID. And one of the things that we spent a great deal of time doing when, uh, when we were in the peak of it in, back in April uh, was talking across the country about referral networks for shockwave lithotripsy in line with the GERF recommendations for uh, urology area networks. And I'm particularly grateful to my good friend Steve Gordon for all of his efforts on that. Uh, and the Endo Urology Committee, and indeed everybody who stepped up and said that they would be prepared to take uh, to take acute um, stone referrals. Certainly at UCH, we did a, a great deal more ureteric stone work, uh, and I'm sure that uh, if the second wave 
uh, hits us or even just in smaller areas that would be something that would be uh, really useful for everybody uh, and particularly the patient and it's with the, the patient in mind uh, that the renal colic audit um, including an app that um, that will and rob and um, sarah fowler um, and many of us on the committee have spent a lot of time doing uh, will become available and online there's more of that in this meeting but the uh, the period that we'll look at the data will be November, uh, as in now, uh, and we will collect the data in, in March. It's not a thing to panic about. Uh, it's genuinely an audit. It's genuinely about quality improvement. And therefore, this is our baseline uh, audited against the nice uh, guidelines and standards, but with a view to using that as a tool to make, uh, to make real improvements for our patients. The future vision, um, we have a visionary leader in Tim O'Brien and he mentioned this of course uh, the, uh, in his initial presidential online address um, about the future and about the need for change and working differently and one of the things is how the sections uh, will work next year and into the future. This will be a big topic of debate at the Bowes Council meeting uh, that will take place in January. So if you've got thoughts, uh, particularly about some of the things that might, might obviously lend themselves to being done differently, those conditions in which uh, perhaps we're the diagnosticians uh, and the section of, uh, of oncology actually treats the disease, upper tract uh, TCC that needs a nephrourethrectomy, uh, or the PUJ where we do some diagnostics um, and they perhaps do the uh, robotic pyeloplasty. And the reverse is true with benign prostatic enlargement um, that we largely share with our new colleagues um, to whom um, uh, we were grateful for the opportunity to do a big joint session uh, had we been live, but that's a, a work now that will be deferred until next year. Can't mention any of those things uh, without the collection of people who've done all of the work. Uh, it seems crazy to think that as this meeting takes place in November that we actually started the planning for it in June last year and an 18 month tour de force that's changed various times in, uh, in the iterations of, uh, of the meeting being in person, then hybrid and then completely virtual. So all of these people who've done so much each has the email so if you've got ideas uh, then please do get in contact with whoever is local to you. We've got a pretty reasonable spread um, across uh, the country, but the country being England, uh, there's opportunities to uh, uh, get the devolved nations perhaps involved. The two blue dots uh, are our, some of our previous presidents uh, in Dickey and uh, Sam McClinton, uh, who span the country, but there's um, maybe opportunities to get a, a wider spread of representation on the committee. Because inclusion is what it's all about, and we welcome endourologists into the section from everywhere, we've already got a burst representative and our BSOC representative, a co-opted general urologist to uh, keep us grounded and sensible. And we'll look to um, expand with uh, co-opted members perhaps through 2021, um, including more opportunities to work closely with our amazing cohort of specialist nurses. We sent a survey around last year about skill sets, um, who's got a specialist nurse, who wants one, not everybody had one, but everybody wanted one. Uh, and that's a piece of work that we'll also look forward to, um, uh, to, to getting sorted over the next uh, 12 months or so to make some progress. So in conclusion, this was a, a slide I saw on Twitter that diversity is being invited to the party. Inclusion is being asked to dance and belonging is like dancing like nobody's watching. I think within uh, Bouse Endo Urology, it's a family and belonging means dancing uh, like everybody's watching. Um, but not caring uh, because uh, because you're you're part of the uh, endo urological family. So please do get involved. Um, if you've got ideas, thoughts, things that you should happen in uh, BAUS 2021 or even in Nottingham uh, when we meet hopefully in person, uh, do send an email, uh, put up a tweet, uh, a direct message or get in contact with the committee member uh, who works closest to you. Have a good rest of conference.